let's talk to you guys start okay uh, so good evening all uh, today uh, the topic will be from obstetrics and gynecology um, the topic that i'll be taking today is uh, anatomy of the female genitalia and uh, puberty and menopause so this this topic it's like um, it should cover both anatomy and physiology so puberty and menopause in adolescence everything comes under the physiology of uh, female genital tract so both anatomy and physiology will be covered in this class so let's uh, go about it so the aim of this uh, session would be to study about the anatomy of female genitalia puberty and menopause and the objectives set for this sessions would be uh, to describe about the anatomy of external female genitalia so we know the female genitalia is broadly classified into internal and external so the first objective would be external female genitalia to describe about the anatomy of internal female genitalia next and then to describe changes during puberty so the once the anatomy is over we would be discussing about puberty and under the puberty we would be discussing about the menstrual physiology <clears throat> what are the changes and why uh, the changes that occurs in puberty after puberty why the changes occurs that would be dealt in the menstrual physiology and to describe about the menstrual cycle so what are the changes in the cycle there are phases in the cycle so what are the physiological changes and why it happens the uh, all that would be discussed and then to describe about menopause so in the end what is menopause and how it is uh, uh, what are the main things uh, that is included in menopause and all these uh, things objectives would be uh, discussed with uh, relation to uh, the questions that would come so i would request uh, whoever is attending uh, to note down i have highlighted few uh, points in uh, red so those would be the possible questions that could come in aipgt or any other competitive exams so let's start with the first objective so the anatomy part of female genital tract so the external genitalia so the uh, uh, what are the parts included in external genitalia there would be mons veneris labia majora labia minora clitoris vestibule and perineum so these are the parts that are included in the external genitalia these form the external genitalia of a female genital tract and we'll see what are included in internal genitalia so they are vagina uterus fallopian tubes and ovary so these are the parts that are included in the internal genitalia so one by one we would see what is mons pubis or mons veneris so this part whichever is showed in the arrow that is mons pubis and then uh, it is a pad of subcutaneous adipose connective tissue so if it is uh, highlighted in red then make sure that it is noted that point is noted so that it it will be easy for you to revise and then lying in front of the pubis and in adult female it is covered by hair so this is the mons when there is a mons pubis so the next part is labia majora so labia majora in on a uh, vulva part the uh, on the vulva part there are each side there is uh, labia majora so here you can see the markings okay on each side there is labia majora and in the surface of labia majora are hairless this is very important so uh, the surface which is the outer surface is that has hair follicle and all the other glands but on um, the inner surface of labia majora it is hairless and sebaceous gland it contains labia majora contains sebaceous glands sweat glands and hair follicles next is labia minora so the importance of labia minora is one point is it is devoid of fat there is no fat in labia minora so here it is marked so this part is labia minora so the marking is given here uh, and uh, on either side just within the labia Uh, just within the uh, labia majora so there is no hair follicle so this should be noted down that labia minora doesn't have any hair follicle labia majora has hair follicle but on the inner surface there is no hair follicle labia minora completely doesn't have hair follicles so there is something called fossa navicularis and it is between the forchette and vaginal orifice next part is the clitoris 
So it is a small cylindrical erect erectile body. So the erectile tissue of a female genital tract, if it is us, it is clitoris. So it is 2.5 centimeter. Always note the measurements in any anatomy part, any subject for that matter, always remember the uh, measurements. So 2.5 centimeter and the parts of uh, clitoris are. So you can see here glands, okay. And this is the body and then two crura. So two crura means two, uh, uh, what is it, branches. Okay. And then suspensory ligament. This is a ligament that attaches clitoris to the undersurface of symphysis pubis. So this is a clitoris. And next part is vestibule. So it is a triangular space. And there are four openings in the vestibule. Urethral opening, vaginal opening, Bartholin's ducts on either side, ducts of paraurethral uh, urethral, uh, glands of scheme. So these are the four openings in vestibule. So the posterior part of vestibule between forchette and vaginal opening is called fossa navicularis. So we saw that what is fossa navicularis? It is between forchette and vaginal opening. So the posterior part of vestibule has this fossa navicularis. And during childbirth, so if the question is asked about carunculae myritiformis, what it is? It is the lacerated hymen after the childbirth. So once the hymen is extremely lacerated, it uh, cicatrizes. That means uh, uh, scarring happens. The healing will happen and then scarring will happen and it is characterized by cicatrized nodules so there are nodules so this nodules cicatrized nodules is called carunculae myriti formis and this is after childbirth next vaginal orifice and hymen so this is uh, uh, present the posterior end of the vestibule. It is incompletely closed by a septum of mucous membrane called hymen. So what is hymen? Hymen is a septum of mucous membrane. So it is incompletely closing this vaginal orifice. And the blood supply to vulva. So it is by internal pudendal artery, nerve supply to vulva, pudendal nerve, Lymphatic drainage to vulva inguinal nodes and lymphatic drainage to clitoris. It is lymph nodes of clockwork, Rosenmuller lymph nodes. So just remember. So if the options are given, Rosenmuller lymph nodes are lymphatic drainage of which part? Or lymphatic drainage of clitoris is which lymph nodes? It is Rosenmuller lymph nodes or lymph nodes of clocket. So this part is very uh, important. This uh, uh, repeatedly asked question uh, comes from this part. It is homologous to male genitalia. So which part of female genitalia is considered homologous to male genitalia? So that we'll see. So the labia majora is considered homologous to scrotum of male genitalia. And labia minora is considered homologous to ventral aspect of penis. And clitoris is considered homologous to the penis of male genitalia. Bartholin's duct, it is considered homologous to bulbo-urethral gland of male genitalia. And vestibular bulbs, it is considered homologous to single bulb of penis. And skein's gland, it is considered homologous to prostate. So just remember these because there is a short question from this part of uh, uh, what to say, of a portion because uh, the question is like labia majora is homologous to which part of male genitalia. So uh, you can, uh, the options would be given, scrotum is the answer. So that way you just remember this part. Next is vagina. So uh, we finished the external genitalia. Now we are coming to internal genitalia. So one by one, we'll see what it is. So vagina, the first part of uh, internal genitalia, development of vagina, that is the embryological part. So upper or above the hymen, whatever vaginal part is there, the mucous membrane is right from the endoderm of canalized sinovaginal bulbs. So this is the origin of the upper or above the hymen and the musculature, the muscles are developed from the mesoderm of two fused mullerian ducts. The lower or below the hymen, the lower part, it is derived from the endoderm of the urogenital sinus. So the upper is derived from endoderm of canalized sinovaginal bulbs, muscles from the mesoderm of two fused mullerian ducts and the lower or below the hymen is derived from endoderm of the urogenital sinus. This is the embryology part. And vaginal canal, what is vaginal canal? It is directed upwards and backwards, forming an angle of 45 degree with the horizontal in erect pos uh, posture. So when you're sitting in erect posture, so the canal is directed upwards and backwards and it forms an angle of 45 degrees. So angles, just remember, because there are other angles which will come up in uterus also. So here in vaginal canal, the angle is 45 degree. The diameter of the canal is 2.5 centimeter, being the widest at its upper part and narrower narrowest at its introitus that is opening so here there it is narrowest and widest in the upper part 
and vagina is head shaped when a transverse section is taken so when uh, if it is seen it is head shaped and length of anterior wall is 8 cm of vagina and length of posterior wall is 10 cm so fornices there are four fornices in vagina anterior posterior and two lateral so anterior just remember the shallowest fornices of vaginal fornices anterior and the deepest uh, fornice of vagina is the posterior part and two lateral are there and vaginal epithelium what is the epithelium of vagina that is non keratinized stratified squamous with no mucus secreting glands there are no glands in vaginal epithelium so uh, if at all a question is asked which is the sec mucus secreting gland of vagina don't um, be confused because there is no mucus secreting glands in vaginal epithelium the vaginal secretion whatever is there it is derived from cervix endocervical and endometrial glands and bartholin's glands so it is not related the vagina there is no vagina vaginal gland as such okay and here you can uh, appreciate the posterior fornix and here is the anterior fornix and these two form the lateral fornix so the uh, shallowest is anterior the deepest that means it is going into and that is posterior the uh, two uh, are lateral Next, vaginal pH is acidic in nature. That is, the uh, pH is four to five, and this is also an important question that comes up during which phase you have to uh, give importance. So, when the question is formed, it will be vaginal uh, pH is uh, acidic or basic, whatever it is, from which period of uh, reproductive cycle that you should see. So, it is acidic from puberty to menopause. So, after uh, menopause, it is not acidic, or before puberty, it is not acidic. so from puberty to menopause it is acidic the ph is around 4 to 5 because of dodelin's bacilli and gram positive lactobacilli that produces lactic acid from glycogen present in the exfoliated cells so the ph during puberty to menopause is acidic and before puberty and after menopause the vaginal ph is about 7 which is not acidic and for hormonal cytology the vaginal smear which part of vagina is taken the a uh, part which is taken is the lateral wall of upper third of vagina is lightly scraped since this part is most sensitive to hormonal influence so the which part is taken for hormonal cytology it is lateral wall of the upper third of vagina next relationships of a vagina with other parts so anteriorly it is related to upper two third of vagina is related to bladder and then lower one third is to urethra posteriorly the upper one third is recto uterine pouch of douglas and middle one third is related to ampulla of rectum and lower one third is related to perineal body and laterally uh, up Upper one third of vagina is related to mackenrodt's ligament or pelvic cella tissue levator ani the lower one third is related to levator ani bulbo cavernosus vestibular bulb and bartholin's glands blood supply of vagina vaginal artery branch of anterior division of internal iliac artery or directly from uterine artery so remember this blood supply because most of the blood supply of female genital tract is from this so this is an important uh, part that is anterior division of internal iliac artery so one more is uh, the rectal artery and ovarian artery so the uterine artery is a branch of this this artery so just remember anterior division of internal iliac artery is basically the major part of uh, female genital tract is supplied by this so vaginal artery is a branch of this and cervical vaginal branch of uterine artery and middle rectal artery the veins which uh, the venous uh, venous supply they uh, drain into the internal iliac veins next is nerve supply upper vagina has sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation that is s2 to s4 and then lower part of vagina is supplied by pudendal nerve lymphatics on each side they drain into the upper one third and middle one third up to the hymen into the internal iliac group of lymph nodes and below the hymen so this is upper one third and middle one third below the hymen into superficial inguinal group so. next so this completes vagina next uh, let's come uh, to uterus so uh, as we have seen so this is a picture and fundus of the uterus body of the uterus and here the isthmus and then cervix cervix so 
anatomical internal os you have to remember uh, histological internal os and supravaginal portion poshovaginal is external os so there are two uh, internal os are two uh, anatomical and histological the importance of uh, is different like why anatomical why histological we we'll see and corpus or body is this so and two fallopian tube fallopian tube will be next so uterus we'll see what it is uterine position or measurement how uh, the uterus is position normal position of uterus so the normal position is antiversion you all know angle between long axis of cervix and vagina is 90 degree i told the degrees you have to remember so in the vaginal canal what we saw was 45 degree so here the antiversion of long axis of cervix between cervix and vagina it is 90 degree and then anti flexion so the angle between long axis of cervix and body of uterus it is 120 degree to 130 degree so this is antiversion and anti flexion position and then uterus usually inclines to the right that is dextro rotated whereas cervix is inclined to left that is levo rotated and comes in close relation to left ureter measurements so uterus measures totally 8 cm the total measurement entire measurement of uterus is 8 cm long and of this only a cervix is 2.5 cm and the wide uh, uh, wide or the um, uh, width of the uterus is 5 cm and the thickness of uterus is 1.5 cm and weight of non pregnant uterus is 50 to 80 grams whereas of pregnant uterus it is 1000 grams and length of pregnant uterus is 35 cm and capacity of non pregnant uterus is 10 ml volume and the pregnant uterus is 5000 ml so just remember all these measurements next uterine structure so uterus consists of body or the corpus isthmus and cervix so superior lot laterally the body projects and is called cornu of the uterus structures attached to the cornu that is superior lateral projection body is projected so the structures that are attached are round ligament fallopian tube and ovarian ligament now body of the uterus so the there are three layers in the body of the uterus they are inner endometrium middle myometrium and outer perimetrium so the outer layer is called the perimetrium or the serosa the middle layer is is called the myometrium and the inner layer which forms the cavity of the uterus that is called the endometrium so there is no submucosal layer that is there is no layer in between myometrium and endometrium so the endometrium is directly opposed to the myometrium and endometrium is the mucosa of the uterine cavity and is lined by ciliated columnar epithelium so what is the epithelium that is uh, lined in endometrium it is ciliated columnar epithelium and myometrium it has three layers outer longitudinal smooth muscle and middle criss crossing muscle fibers and inner circular muscle fibers the middle layer of myometrium that is criss crossing muscle fibers this middle uh, uh, layer it acts as a living ligature during involution of uterus and prevents the blood loss so which is the living ligature of uterus uh, during involution it is the middle layer of the myometrium next is the most part of the uterus so it is 0.5 cm very small extends from the anatomical internal os above so what forms the anatomical internal os anatomical internal os is endometrial canal becomes the cervical canal so that is anatomical uh, internal os and what is histological internal os it is where the epithelium of uterus changes to epithelium of cervix so canal becoming cervical endometrial canal becoming cervical canal is anatomical internal os and the epithelium of uterus is uh, changing into epithelium of cervix is the histological internal os so cervix supravaginal part is called endocervix and it is lined by simple columnar epithelium and vaginal part of cervix that is exocervix is lined by stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium so this squamo uh, columnar junction of cervix it is situated at the external os so here we can see columnar in so endocervix and squamous in exocervix so there must be a junction where both are meeting right so that is in the external os and corpus is to cervix ratio that is body of the uterus to cervix ratio before puberty it is 1 is to 2 that is body is bigger than the uh, smaller than the cervix and at puberty it becomes 2 is to 1 that is body is bigger than the cervix and in adults or reproductive age what it becomes it becomes three times bigger the body so the body of the uterus is three times and three is to one that is cervix is one part so this is the uh, corpus that is body of the uterus is to cervix ratio 
and the cervix is the most fixed part of the uterus so we know uh, this dextro rotation levo rotation and all the parts so but cervix is the most fixed part of the uterus the peritoneum between the uterus and bladder forms the uterovesical pouch and between the uterus and rectum forms the recto uterine pouch which is the pouch of douglas so uh, pouch of douglas is the peritoneum it is a peritoneum which is between uterus and rectum which is formed between and if it is formed between uterus and bladder it is uterovesical we can uh, relate it with the uh, word meaning itself uterus vesical means bladder and here recto means rectum and uterine means uterus and in the upright position when you are standing this is the most dependent part of the peritoneal cavity and in the supine position when you are sleeping it is the most dependent part on of the pelvic cavity next blood supply of uterus it is uterine artery again it is a branch of anterior division of internal iliac artery and ovarian artery and uterine veins drain into the internal iliac vein and nerve supply of uterus sympathetic nerves are from t5 and t6 that is motor and t10 to l1 spinal segments that is sensory and parasympathetic fibers motor and sensory it is s234 end in the ganglia of frankenhauser lymphatic drainage of uterus from fundus and upper part of the body that is corpus to uh, they drain into pre aortic and lateral aortic group of lymph nodes and from cornu uh, they drain into superficial inguinal node gland and um, from lower part of the body to external iliac group of nodes and from cervix they drain into the internal iliac nodes hypogastric nodes obturator presacral that is paracervical nodes and external iliac nodes next we'll see what are the supports of uterus what supports the uterus and uh, how it is this there so the primary supports or active supports are levator ani muscles of pelvic diaphragm perineal body and muscles of urogenital diaphragm deep transverse perineal and sphincter urethrae muscles so these are the primary or uh, active supports of uterus the fibromuscular ligamentous supports that is mechanical support so uh, which uh, the um, what are the parts that provide mechanical support they are the transverse cervical ligaments that is cardinal ligament and mckinrod ligament which contains uterine vessels and round ligament of uterus is a mechanical support and few the cervical ligament and uterosacral ligament and ne next is secondary or doubtful this is not like confirmed they provide support so they are doubtful supports only folds of peritoneum they are just peritoneum folds and they are broad ligament uterovesical fold of peritoneum and rectovaginal fold of peritoneum which is pouch of douglas so these are the secondary supports of uterus so here you can appreciate all the uh, supports so uterosacral ligament fascia around the rectum and cardinal ligament which is this and paracervical ring pubo cervical fascia bladder para vesical fascia and then this is rect, uh, retropubic space vesico uterine that is bladder uterus so uh, cervix and para vesical space recto uterine space para rectal space and rectum so this are these are the supports so th these are the structures that provide support to the cervix which will be from the cervix next we'll come to fallopian tube so as we see here fallopian tube has four main parts so interstitial part is here and isthmus part ampulla and then infundibulum with the fimbriae so uh, we'll see each one of it so fallopian tube is present in the upper free margin of broad ligament of uterus so it is 10 cm in length it is lined by ciliated columnar epithelium and secretory pex cells are also present in proximal part of the so blood supply to fallopian tube it is from uterine artery again which is a branch of internal iliac artery so medial 2/3 is supplied by uterine artery and lateral 1/3 is supplied from ovarian artery venous drainage is from pampiniform plexus into the ovarian veins and lymphatic drainage into the para aortic nodes so there are four parts of fallopian tube so each of it will see what is the importance so intramural or interstitial part it is 1 cm long and it is the shortest and narrowest the question might come that which is the shortest and narrowest part of fallopian tube so you should remember it is the interstitial part and it lies in the uterine wall and it acts as anatomical sphincter 
so even question can come as which is the anatomic sphincter which acts as uh, anatomic sphincter in fallopian tube so you must be able to answer the interstitial part so isthmus it is 3 cm long so as is physiological sphincter so the anatomical sphincter is interstitial part and isthmus part is the physiologic sphincter due to why because it has circular smooth muscle and adrenergic innervation and the most common site of ligation during tubal ligation it is in the isthmus part okay an ampulla it is 5 cm long it is the longest and widest part so you should be able to remember which is the longest and widest part of fallopian tube it is ampulla and fertilization usually occurs uh, of ova takes place in ampulla and the most common site of ectopic pregnancy that is pregnancy outside the uterus it takes place in uh, ampulla part of the fallopian tube and then in fundibulum it is also called the fimbrial end and what is the function of fimbria fimbria it actually functions uh, main function is during the ovulation period so once the when uh, ovulation has to occur it has a sweeping mechanism on the uh, ovary so that it can uh, absorb the ova that is coming out and then it can send it to the ampulla where the ova ovum waits for fertilization so that is the function of fimbria next broad ligament the broad ligament is a large peritoneal fold that attaches the uterus to the lateral pelvic wall subdivisions of broad ligament mesovarium mesosalpinx mesometrium and suspensory ligament of ovary that is infundibulo pelvic ligament so these are the contents what are the contents in the uh, division subdivisions of broad ligament so mesovarium it connects the posterior layer of the broad ligament with the anterior surface of ovary so mesovarium uh, you can see over okay so it is actually related to ovary okay so it, it contains ovarian blood vessels and nerve plexus next mesosalpinx so fold of broad ligament that suspends a uterine tube so salpinx means tube so th that way you can relate so it is related to uterine tube fallopian tube contains uterine tube round ligament of uterus ligament of ovary paraophoron and epiphoron and mesometrium extends from pelvic floor to the uterine body contains so metrium means endo uh, uterus so you can relate it that way and contains uterine vessels utero vaginal nerve plexus uh, duct of gardner suspensory ligament it contains the ovarian vessels lymphatic and nerve plexus so these four mesovarium mesosalpinx mesometrium along with suspensory ligament forms the broad ligament next ovary so ovary is an intraperitoneal structure lying in the ovarian fossa of waldier on the lateral pelvic wall ovarian fossa is bounded anteriorly by the obliterated umbilical artery posteriorly by the ureter and internal iliac artery and floor that is lateral surface of ovarian fossa consists of obturator nerve and vessels so the what are the ligaments of ovary so the anterior border of the ovary is attached to the posterior layer of the broad ligament by the mesovarium as we saw earlier so anterior border is attached to the uh, posterior layer of the mesovarium and lateral part where it is attached lateral part of broad ligament of uterus forms a distinct fold known as suspensory ligament so what is suspensory ligament of ovary it is the lateral part of broad ligament of uterus which is forming a fold so in fundibulo pelvic ligament it is also called so it contains the ovarian vessels and nerves next ligament of ovarian 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 ligament is a derivative of gibber naculum uh, and connects the lower pole of ovary to the lateral angle of uterus so which is the ligament uh, which is the ligament that connects from um, uh, connects the lower pole of ovary to the uterus it is ligament of ovary or ovarian ligament and note the posterior border is a free border of the ovary so the posterior border of ovary it is not connected to anything it is a free border next histology of ovary o ovary is lined by single layer of tubical cells known as a germinal epithelium of waldeyer and ovarian cortex has follicles in various stage of development so we know there are uh, uh, types of follicles from primordial to the graphian so how they develop so ovarian cortex has this follicle and ovarian medulla consists of hyalus cells so which are homologous to the interstitial cells of testis they are found most commonly at the pregnancy and at menopause but their function is unknown what this uh, what is the function of this hyalus cells it's unknown but tumors arising from these cause muscularization so probably the probable theory is because at one point there are a few cells which are produce um, androgens in ovary so maybe this hyalus cells is related to that 
nerve supply sympathetic fibers arise from preganglionic uh, fibers at the uh, t10 and t11 uh, level and supply the ovaries and fallopian tubes through sympathetic fibers that follow the ovarian vessels ovaries like the testes are sensitive to manual squeezing so uh, ovarian pain can be referred to peri umbilical that is t10 region and to the medial side of the thigh that is distribution of obturator nerve intractable ovarian pain may be relieved by cutting the suspensory ligament which contains ovarian plexus the blood supply of ovary ovarian artery again that arises from the aorta just below the renal artery and right ovarian vein drains into the inferior vena cava while left ovarian vein drains into the left renal vein and lymphatic drainage is into the para aortic or lateral aortic nodes so this finishes the anatomical part of the uh, female genital tract so now we'll go to the physiological part so beginning with puberty so why puberty occurs what is the reason so we'll see what is puberty puberty is a period of gradual development of secondary sexual characters in a female and tanner and marshall they uh, actually uh, gave a important five uh, important physical changes that occurs when puberty starts so that is first is breast changes pubic changes axillary hair growth growth in height and menstruation so this order is very important because it is a repeated question in competitive exams so which is the first change that occurs during puberty so that is actually the answer is breast budding that is tlark so just remember tlark is the first so growth spot means um, the beginning of growth in in every manner but the first change growth uh, first change that occurs is breast budding that is tlark and pu followed by pubic and axillary hair growth that is adrenarch and peak growth in height and followed by menstruation menarch so when uh, it is asked which is the first uh, change that occurs don't uh, be confused and uh, like answer menarch so it is first tlark followed by adrenarch followed by menarch so tanner staging so he is given a uh, tanner is given stages five stages of uh, development of breast and pubic hair so uh, let's see what it is stage 1 is pre pubertal stage that is even before puberty elevation of papilla only in the breast so and pubic hair there is no pubic hair present whereas in stage 2 it it occurs during 9 point the average years which where it occurs is 9.8 years so there are breast buds and papilla slightly elevated and side of labia areola begins to enlarge so slightly there is enlargement in the areola part so that is the breast change in pubic hair the change is sparse long hair on either um, majora and uh, that is outer external majora which occurs around uh, 10 years of age and stage 3 is for further enlargement of entire breast tissue and in pubic hair the change is darker coarser and curly hair over the mons pubis and stage 4 is secondary mound of areola and papilla projecting about the uh, um breast tissue so there is a formation of secondary mound and then papilla is projecting above breast tissue so initially it was slightly elevated now it is projecting above this occurs around 12 years and in pubic hair the changes adult type of hair covering the mons only that is in 12 years and in uh, stage 5 Uh, breast changes areola is recessed to general contour of the breast so areola is also uh, recessed so here it, it occurs in a four, uh, 14.6 uh, years so here the breast is almost developed and in pubic hair the adult hair with an inverse triangle distribution so this inverse triangle distribution of hair distribution is known as female estrusion so this um, occurs in the around 13.7 years covering the medial thigh so these are the changes the staging the sta tanner is given in breast and pubic hair next we'll see menstrual physiology so as you can you can see in the uh, picture so this is the zero day that is up once uh, after the menses what happens until the menses occurs 28 days so what are the changes that occur in endometrium in ovary in uh, the uh, hormones what are the fsh all these hormones what are the changes that occurs let's see that so the menstrual cycle consists of ovarian cycle and the uterine or endometrial cycle which occur parallelly so we there is something called hypothalamo pituitary ovarian axis that is utero ovarian axis so which controls the hormonal secretion which controls the cy this cycle menstrual cycle and it is into endometrial or uterine changes and then ovarian changes 
So we have two phases, that is ovarian phase and uterine or endometrial phase. And then what are the events that occur and what are the histology? So when endometrial biopsy is done, what are the histological changes that is seen? So follicular phase. So first the ovarian uh, immediately, um, if it starts with follicular phase. So follicular phase is um, leading to luteal phase. So follicular phase is the first 14 days of a cycle. So this phase can vary in length, begins on the first day of menstruation. So this is not fixed. So follicular phase is not fixed. But the um, after ovulation, the uh, whichever phase is uh, the luteal phase, that is fixed. That is for 14 days. So it, if the cycle, in very, uh, irrespective of the cycle length, if it is a 40 day cycle, uh, 35 days, it is pathological, obviously. But then when ovulation occurred, if you have to see, it is always menstru uh, menstruation minus the um, 14 days. So that is uh, ovulation day. Okay, so follicular phase one to 14 days, this phase can vary in length and begins on first day of menstruation. Whereas uh, in uterine, the menstrual phase consists of one uh, to five days. So this is going on. And then the event that occurs is low estrogen and progesterone level causes withdrawal of hormonal support to the endometrium. That is why there is shedding of the endometrium, which causes necrosis and endometrium is shed off. And the histological change that occurs is stratum functional and coiled arteries are absent when histology is done. Next is proliferative phase. So now the endometrium is beginning to proliferate. That is uterine. The endometrium is beginning to proliferate from day 6 to 14, estrogenic phase. So here it is, uh, the action of uh, is uh, more uh, dominant of estrogen. Dominated by estrogen effect that induces replacement of endometrial cells lost during the menses. And then uh, histology, it is stratum functional is thin, endometrial glands are straight and arteries are less coiled. Next, after 14, uh, 14th day, ovulation occurs. Why ovulation occurs? There is LH surge, induces the ovulation and the histology subnuclear basal vacuolation is earliest evidence of ovulation and after ovulation the luteal phase starts in ovary that is 15 to 28 days and luteal means secretory phase and endometrium is luted so secretory phase 70 15 to 28 days dominated by progesterone which along with estrogen prepares the endometrium for implantation here they are waiting for the fertilized um, ovum so for implantation so that is why the progesterone and estrogen is preparing the uterus uh, for uh, implantation. And saw-toothed endometrial glands, corkscrew-shaped and highly coiled spiral arteries and stromal edema is seen in the histologic So in detail, let's see. So follicular phase or estrogenic phase starts. So first day to 14 day, follicular phase can vary in length. And it begins on the first day of menstrual cycle. FSH stimulates the growth of graphene follicle. So we all know uh, that primordial follicle are present and primordial follicle should develop into graphene follicle. Only then the matured graphene follicle can, um, what to say, ovum is released from a mature graphene follicle. So what happens, which hormone is responsible for that, for maturation of graphene follicle? It is follicular stimulating hormone. And granulosa cells of ovarian follicle secretes the estradiol. Estradiol induces endometrial proliferation and further increases FSH and LH secretion. So here it is positive feedback. So we all know that hypothalamopituitary ovarian axis has two feedbacks, positive feedback and negative feedback. So in positive feedback, what happens? Estrogen is more, estrogen is high. So estrogen gives a signal to the hypothalamus to secrete more gonadotropin releasing hormone, which again gives uh, the uh, signal to the anterior pituitary to secrete more FSH and LH. So this positive feedback is going on, um, uh, is responsible for the increased FSH and LH throughout the follicular phase of the cycle. And ovulation occurs on the day 15. What happens? Now the negative feedback starts. So uh, the negative feedback is gone and suddenly FSH is uh, reduced, inhibited, and then LH is increased very highly. So that uh, is the reason for ovulation. So ovulation occurs 14 days before menses regardless of the cycle. So ovulation day is equal to menstruation minus the 14. Even the cycle is prolonged to 40 days. Ovulation is always 14 days before menses. So estrogen surge uh, occurs before ovulation, which stimulates the LH and inhibits the FSH. So this rise in LH or LH surge induces ovulation. Very repeated question. That is ovulation, which is the hormone or what is the change that occurs during ovulation? LH surge 
urge you should remember and cervical mucus increases the quantity and becomes less viscous and highly elastic so during this period ovulation period the uh, uh, cervix becomes very uh, viscous and highly elastic why because it uh, it is an anticipation of sperm the ovum is an anticipation of sperm so for that reason the cervical mucus is uh, making uh, the sperm more penetrable and increase hyaluronic acid so what are the causes for uh, more um, what is a uh, penetration of sperm is easier during ovulation why the reason are one is cervical mucus is less viscous and highly elastic one more is increased hyaluronic acid and decreased dermatum sulfate and collagen makes the mucus so these are the reasons why it becomes more penetrable for the sperm and firming of mucus occurs due to estrogen action so some there is something called as mitral uh, mitmers mitral schmers so this is pain of ovulation so few girls they uh, experience pain during ovulation that is 14 days or the mid cycle they experience a pain which mimics appendicitis that is because of the rupture of the follicle which causes the Uh, peritoneal ir uh, irritation so the rupture is occurring so that the ova can come out so that uh, pain is uh, mimicking like appendicitis but it is not appendicitis and ocps that is oral contraceptive pills prevent estrogen surge so why ocps are given so that um, uh, ovulation does not occur why because it prevents the estrogen surge so once estrogen surge is there there is no uh, negative feedback so again there is no inhibition of fsh and there is no lh surge so that is the mechanism how uh, the oral contraceptive pills uh, do so after this once ovulation is occurred there is a secretory phase luteal phase or progesterone phase so this is what this is from day 15 to 28 that is menses occurs this phase is continuing and luteal phase is usually constant it is constant for 14 days and the residual follicles so the ovum is come out now the graphene follicle the ovum is released now the follicle which is remaining this, this is called corpus luteum so begins to develop and synthesizes estrogen and progesterone so this corpus luteum has a capacity to produce estrogen and progesterone so progesterone stimulates endometrial glandular secretion and vascular development in anticipation of fertilized egg now this phase is where the uterus is waiting for the fertilized egg uh, fertilized ovum for implantation so what progesterone does it is preparing the uterus for the um, implantation so it is increasing the blood supply to the endometrium it is preparing in such a way that uh, it is pro uh, it can provide nutrition for the implanted ovum uh, fertilized ovum so next basal body temperature increases due to the effect of progesterone so here the main hormone that uh, occurs or is uh, the effect of main hormone is progesterone which is also called the maintaining hormone so it is maintaining the uterus so that uh, the implanted uh, fertilized ovum can come and if the ovum is not fertilized the corpus luteum regresses and progesterone and estradiol level decrease so this corpus luteum is the one um, uh, one part which is uh, giving estrogen and progesterone a high secretion of estrogen and progesterone once the corpus luteum gets the signal that there is no fertilization uh, that has not happened then what happens it the lute uh, corpus luteum regresses and automatically the progesterone and estrogen levels decreases and the endometrium so now there is no nutrition for the endometrium there is no uh, blood supply glandular secretion vascular no, nothing is there for the endometrium and that is the reason why endometrium is sloughed off with the uh, occurrence of menses so ovarian follicle we'll see how was the uh, ovarian follicle developed so before puberty all follicles in the ovary are in primordial follicle stage so uh, if before puberty it will not uh, develop into primary uh, follicle or secondary follicle or graphene follicle only uh, puberty will um, uh, is responsible for it so before that it is only in primordial follicle stage so in primordial follicle stage the oocyte is arrested in last stage of prophase also known as dictyotin stage so you should remember the second um, uh, what to say first division occurs in primordial follicles and it is arrested it is not uh, going into secondary division so it is arrested in last stage of prophase and pulsatile range of gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus along with the non pulsatile release of the leptin has a major role in initiation of puberty so hypothalamus is one uh, um, what is a part or uh, structure which is responsible for the puberty 
and thus at puberty further development of primordial follicle occurs. So once gonadotrophin releasing hormone is secreting, then what happens? It goes and uh, stimulates the anterior pituitary to secrete follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So once follicle stimulating hormone is secreted, then the um, uh, what to say the activation of this primordial follicle. The primordial follicle stage will go into primary secondary graphene because of follicle stimulating hormone. So ovarian follicles mature through four developmental stage. One is primordial, next primary, secondary, and graphene. So it's the mature graphene follicle that undergoes ovulation. So ovulation occurs in mature graphene follicle. And just before ovulation, the size of this graphene follicle is 19 to 20 mm with a volume of 2.5 mm. So the volume of graphene follicle before ovulation is highly increased. So that is why there is a pressure created and then ovum is released. The rupture is because of this increase in volume and uh, because of the hormonal influence on the uh, graphene follicle. And then there is rupture and there is ovulation. Then there is something called follicular recruitment. So not all primordial follicles. There are uh, many number of primordial follicles in an ovary. So, but not all will uh, be uh, converted or uh, developed into primary, secondary, and graphene. Only few uh, are um, converted. So that is called as follicular recruitment. That means the process by which certain primordial fo ovarian follicles, which um, which are very healthy, begin growing in a given menstrual cycle. Only few will uh, ten to fifteen will grow into primary, secondary, and then only one will grow into graphene follicle. So uh, this recruitment is called follicular recruitment and it is by FSH. And the rupture, so follicular recruitment is by FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. And ovulation, as we know, it is LH surge, so increased LH. So the rupture of follicle is due to the luteinizing hormone. Next, corpus luteum, we see, we'll see we see what is the importance of it. So after ovulation, the ruptured graphene follicle collapses and fills with a blood clot, clot. So immediately after ovulation, corpus luteum is not corpus luteum. Corpus luteum is corpus hemorrhagicum. And then after that, after the blood clot is, um, what to say, healed, it becomes corpus luteum because of the yellowish color of uh, the uh, appearance. So it is corpus luteum. And if pregnancy does not occur, then the corpus luteum degenerates into corpus albicans, white appearance. That means it is regressing. So what happens? Only if pregnancy occurs, there is only if pregnancy occurs, there is um, this uh, corpus luteum uh, will stay as it is. But if there is no pregnancy, the signal is gone to corpus luteum that uh, there is no fertilization happened, then it will regress into corpus albicans. In non-pregnant state, corpus luteum is maintained by LH. But in pregnancy state, it is maintained by HCG. So who is the one who sends the, um, the signal to corpus luteum that fertilization has occurred? It is the HCG from the fertilized, uh, from the, uh, <clears throat> fertilized ovum. That means a zygote. Uh, it is producing HCG. So it sends uh, the signal that to corpus luteum that, okay, uh, the fertilization has happened. Only then corpus luteum will stay. But whereas in non-pregnant state, the corpus luteum will stay for some time. That is 12 to 14 days. And that is maintained by LH. That is not maintained by HCG. So after that, when the LH, LH starts reducing because of the, uh, again, negative feedback, and there is no uh, FSH, there is no LH, uh, that is why menstrual Menstruation occurs, right? So, uh, because of that, so once the LH is also gone, it is not maintaining now the corpus luteum. That is when it starts regressing and there is, then there is menstruation. <clears throat> so, the lifespan of corpus luteum is about 12 to 14 days. There is something called two shifts in corp, uh, uh, of a corpus luteum, luteal placental shift and luteal follicular shift. So luteal placental shift, it is a turnover, of, a turnover of function from corpus luteum. Now, what is maintaining the uterus? It is the uh, estrogen and progesterone that is produced from corpus luteum. So once uh, of pregnant, uh, once the corpus luteum goes away, something uh, should maintain the uh, uterus. So that shift that is given to the function is given to the placenta placenta of the fetus. So this transition period continue, continues for seven to 10 weeks. So corpus luteum stays in a pregnant state, pregnant women for seven to 10 weeks. After that, it is uh, not there. So the uh, function is taken up by the placenta. So this is essential for the growth of fertilized ovum. So till then corpus luteum uh, gives the nutrition to the fertilized ovum. Now luteal follicular shift, what it is? It is a period that extends from demise of corpus luteum to the selection of a new dominant follicle for the next cycle. So 
after 12 to 14 days corpus luteum doesn't have now lh uh, uh, or is not maintaining the corpus luteum so it has got a signal that fertilization has not occurred and there is regression of corpus luteum now corpus luteum is gone now uh, uh, again now the cycle continues it has to continue so again there is now the preparation of the um, uh, follicle one new uh, again one primordial follicle is changed into primary secondary and then graphene follicle uh, now, uh, for the ovulation so this selection of new dominant follicle and it is usually by the uh, follicle stimulating hormone and that is why it is called luteal follicular shift so these are the two shifts so one occurs in pregnancy one occurs in non pregnancy and corpus luteum is responsible for production of estrogen and progesterone in the first two months of pregnancy so we see saw here that 7 to 10 weeks corpus luteum stays and it is uh, producing estrogen and progesterone so first two months uh, estrogen progesterone is secreted from corpus luteum later on the function is taken up by the placenta so this completes uh, the uh, puberty part and menstrual physiology next is menopause menopause means permanent cessation of menstruation at the end of reproductive life due to ovarian fo follicular inactivity so there is follicular failure ovarian follicular inactivity and stoppage of estrogen so these two things are the main reasons for menopause so there is permanent cessation of menstruation and average age of onset of uh, menopause is 50 years earlier in smokers and if it is premature menopause it should occur be before 40 years and if it is late menopause it should occur uh, after uh, that means the menopause is not even happening even after 55 years the menopause is not acting not uh, happening so that is late menopause next clinical features of menopause is hot flushes so this is one of the characteristic uh, sign of menopause. So one of the main important, uh, this is, can be a question also. So diagnosis of menopause. So one of the main uh, sign of menopause is hot flushes and atrophy of vagina, osteoporosis and coronary artery disease. Hormonal changes reduced estrogen, increased FSH, increased LH, increased gonadotropin releasing hormone. So here also there is occurring, this feedback mechanism is occurring. So estrogen is reduced. So what happens, there is a feedback <clears throat> for the hypothalamus uh, so that uh, to secrete more estrogen. So what happens, FSH comes, uh, FSH and LH is um, uh, secreted so that it can stimulate the ovary to produce more estrogen. What happens, ov ovary follicles are in inactive. Now, uh, uh, even though FSH and LH are coming and stimulating the ovary, it is not able to mature or it is not able to um, stimulate the follicles in the ovary. So that is why estrogen is reduced. So this ovary is unable to secrete the estrogen and then increase gonadotrophin releasing hormone because the feedback mechanism is going directly to hypothalamus first. That is why this um, gonadotrophin releasing hormone is also increased. Next, diagnosis of menopause. The most common symptom of menopause is hot flush. And then how uh, the diagnosis of menopause, uh, and there are five uh, things that is very important for a diagnosis of menopause. So first one is cessation of menses. I'll finish this slide and I'll tell you. So one uh, is hot flush, most common uh, symptom, and elevated FSH. So I told you why uh, FSH is high, but once it is coming and stimulating the ovary, it is not able to do its work. So it is remaining high in the uh, blood. So FSH is more than 40 million international unit per ml, and it is diagnostic of menopause. So once FSH is more than 40, uh, it is a very clear sign that menopause has occurred and postmenopausal levels of FSH is 50 to 100. And estradiol, serum estradiol, that is estrogen is less, that is less than 20 picogram per ml and vaginal cytology. So in the initial part, we saw which part of uh, vagina is uh, taken for um, smear. So the lateral part. So showing uh, there something is done. Uh, called as maturation index. So vaginal cytology is, uh, in vaginal cyt cytology, maturation index is calculated. So what happens, oh, this matu maturation index is the first part. So there, there it is nothing but it is seeing the cells. So uh, they're observing what are the changes in the cells, what type of cells are there. So this first part is parabasal, <clears throat> parabasal cells. And uh, 85, this part is, intermediate cells and this is superficial cells the number of cells usually uh, is 0 by 60 by 40 
usual ratio is this. But what happens in menopause, the ratio is changed. The parabasal cell is increased. The intermediate cell is uh, again increased. And then the superficial cells are decreased. So this is the normal ratio, usually maturation index. This is the index, usual index. But here it is changed. So it is 10 by 85 by 5. So that is um, menopause. So you, usual diagnosis of menopause, how it is done. One, the symptom should be cessation of menses. So obviously menstrual flow shouldn't be there. And then the signs and symptoms, whatever I showed in the previous slide, the hot flush, the... Uh, <clears throat> osteoporotic changes, the atrophy of vagina, coronary artery disease. So this is a uh, reduced estrogenic, uh, estrogen stage uh, state. So that is why these uh, things are coming up. And then the vaginal cytology, this is a diagnostic criteria. And then serum, this is also a diagnostic criteria, which is less than 20 picogram per uh, ml. And then FSH should be more than 40. And how it is done, the value, when it becomes a uh, complete diagnosis of menopause, when it becomes, it becomes when the three values are taken at weeks interval. So three values should be taken. And when three values, also, uh, all the three values show more than 40 uh, uh, milli international per ml, then you can tell, okay, menopause is occurred. So this is diagnosis of menopause. So very important repeated question uh, because um, uh, two papers it has been asked that they, are, they will give some four things and uh, maybe they will change the option as serum estradiol more than 20 picograms. So be very um, careful about it and uh, see what are the values. Next, absolute contraindication for. So one of the uh, treatment that conventional medicine gives for menopause is hormonal replacement therapy. So that this estrogen, decrease in estrogen can be compensated. So, but one of the repeated question from this part is, what are the contraindications for hormonal replacement therapy? So it is active liver disease or gallbladder disease. If it is there, uh, the conventional medicine uh, doctors will not give the hormonal replacement therapy. And undiagnosed uh, vaginal bleeding is there. And cancer, endometrial or uterine cancer, DVT, deep pain thrombosis. This is a repeated question. Okay. Even for HRT, OCP, which is contraindicated, deep pain thrombosis. So the references is the court's principles of gynecology, Tattas. And uh, Sure Success Magic is a guidebook uh, for uh, competitive entrance exams. It is uh, for allied subjects. And then images are from uh, Google and both uh, from uh, textbooks and uh, Google.